I'm going to share my screen for 10.1. Okay, so in this next chapter, we're going to be studying something called conic sections, okay? And when I first learned about conic sections or when I first heard about them, I feel like the name itself made me super nervous. I was like, I don't know, this sounds like a complicated thing. Um, but one of the reasons we've been doing so much graphing is because um, conic sections are actually just like another type of graph. Um, and they're actually pretty useful when you move into like higher and higher level math, okay? So one thing to think about like as we're learning conic sections is this. They're not going to go away. Okay, they, if you learn the conic sections pretty well now, it will pay off when you get to Calc 1. It will pay off when you get to Calc 2. And it will pay off if you need to take Calc 3 as well. So if you learn this next section, like the conic sections part, and you feel like you have a good understanding of it, it will pay off in all three of the calculus classes, okay? Um, some of my former students are in Calc 3 right now, and they're like, oh yeah, we just did all these sections, laconic sections, they're like, we knew them and it just made our life easier, okay? And so it's not just something that I'm saying to like make you buy in here, but I just want you to know very well, like when might you see this again? Okay. All right. So let's get started. What is a conic section or what are conic sections? Okay. So conic sections are sections of cones, right? That's literally what we're talking about here. Sections of cones. And specifically, we're looking at a special kind of cone situation, okay? We call this a double mapped cone, okay? So I'm gonna draw a picture. I'll draw it twice so you can kind of watch how it's being drawn the first time, and then you can sort of follow along the second time, okay? Don't judge the drawings. But basically, a double napped cone is when you take two cones and you stack them so that the pointy parts are touching each other. So that looks something like this. kind of looks like an hourglass, all right? Except in the middle, they actually cross at a point. But basically, you have like two ice cream cones, but the bottoms of the ice cream cones are attached to each other, okay? Um, you can draw this any number of ways. I know some of you out there are quite artistic. Myself, not so much. I just kind of draw diagrams for math class. Um, but let's just go over again how we draw that. So I draw like an oval shape, okay? Just so I can kind of see that it's like going into the page a little bit. Then from one end of the oval, I draw a line, like a diagonal line. And then from the other end of the oval, I draw another diagonal line. It's kind of like an X underneath. And then I connect the bottom two parts of the X with another oval, okay? <clears throat> so we're going to take a look at four different slices of the cone. So four different conic sections. We're going to take a look at two of them today and two of them on Monday. Okay, 
So for the first box here, there are four boxes. The first box, we're gonna go ahead and draw a double napped cone. So you're gonna go ahead and draw an oval. If you want, you can kind of draw the other oval underneath it and then connect the X's. The order doesn't really matter so much. Okay, but you have your two ovals and then you connect with the straight line. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see. Okay. If we take a slice, okay. I don't know how many of you out there eat deli meat, but even if you don't, if you've been to a grocery store, you know, they have like the deli part where it's like, oh, I would like a pound of ham or a pound of chicken or a pound of turkey. And then they kind of like slice it for you. Um, so all the slices are kind of the same shape, right? So like some of them are like squares. Like I feel like the ham one is like kind of square, but like the turkey is usually round. You know, they have like different shapes for different types of meat. But if we were to take a slice and just like cut it like this, okay? And the slice that we take is parallel to the base. Okay, so that pink line is parallel to the top ice cream cone, but also parallel to the bottom of the ice cream cone, okay? If I cut that slice, what shape will that slice be? Yeah, it will be a circle, exactly. And you can almost imagine that for yourself when you look at the ice cream cone like from the top, it's a circle. Okay, so when we take slices that are parallel to the base, what we end up with is a circle, okay? Now this first circle, I would say is maybe like medium size. What happens if I take a slice like here? Is that circle bigger or smaller? That circle's smaller, good. Mm -hmm. And if I took a slice like maybe down here, maybe we could say that that one is larger than the one with the, the first one we looked at, okay? So the circles can be different sizes, right? And um, we're gonna look at how we know how large a specific circle is, okay? That's one of the conic sections that we're gonna learn today. Let's draw another double napped cone in the box to the right. So, okay. And this time, I want us to take a slice that is not quite parallel to the base. So not parallel to the base, okay? So it's not parallel to the base. And it does not go through the base. So it's not parallel to the base and it does not cut through the base. What shape do we have here? Yeah, it's not gonna be a perfect circle anymore because we're taking it on a slant. So it's going to be what we traditionally know as an oval, but we're gonna layer on a newer, fancier term. We're gonna call it the ellipse, okay? And an ellipse, we can think about it, it looks like an oval, right? 
but it's pretty similar to the circle except that it's just a little bit longer in one direction than it is in the other okay All right, let's just draw pictures for the other two shapes we're going to learn on Monday. All right, but we're not going to learn these today. I just want us to kind of have a visual for what they look like. So in these bottom two boxes, let's go ahead and draw two more double napped cones. I'm going to be lazy and copy this one. Whoop. And let's take a slice that now is sort of like the ellipse. It's slanted, but it actually goes through the base, okay? So we can say that it's not parallel to the base, and it does cut through the base. It does cut through the base, okay? Any ideas what shape we have when we do this? I think this one's a little bit harder to see. Mm, it's not a rectangle. Yeah. You get a quadratic. Yeah, exactly. So part of the ellipse is missing. Turns out the part that goes missing means that the rest of the shape is actually a parabola. Okay. So when we cut slanted, but it goes through the base, we actually end up with a parabola. Right. Yeah, pretty cool. All right, we've got one last shape to take a look at. And now we're gonna take a look at a slice that goes straight through both of the cones. Okay, so it um, the cut whoop, the cut cuts through both cones. Right. Now, when we cut through both cones. How might we describe how that looks? How like the shape looks at the end? Would it look kind of like the reciprocal function? It does actually look very much like the reciprocal function. Okay. And the reciprocal function is not just a rational function like we've been studying in 3.7, but it's actually part of a larger family of something called hyperbolas. Okay. Now, I just wanna make one clarification here. You might have learned about a hyperbole in like an English class or something like that. And then hyperbole is like an exaggeration. Hyperbola is different, okay? A hyperbola is like, it's almost like you have two parabolas that are like facing away from each other, okay? So a hyperbole is an exaggeration. Are there two Gs in exaggeration? Not sure, okay. So that's like an exaggeration, but a hyperbola is going to be the shape that we'll learn on Monday, okay? 
So when we sort of think about what we're going to be learning over the next two classes, we're really looking at slices of cones, or the fancy way of saying that is conic section, okay? And today we're going to focus on the circle and the ellipse, all right? So the circle and the ellipse are going to be the two that I want us to know how to graph and describe by the end of this class. All right. Now, before we do that, ha -ha. one of my favorite uh, sort of math skills is something called completing the square, okay? It's something that is super, super useful. So just like I said, we're gonna be doing, um, we're gonna be taking a look at conic sections again in Calc 1, in Calc 2, in Calc 3. Completing the square is a skill that we will be able to use in Calc 1, definitely in Calc 2, like 100% in Calc 2. You're going to need to know how to complete the square and a little bit in Calc 3, okay? So again, this idea of completing the square, we're going to practice that a lot over the next two days. It is a skill I want us to feel comfortable doing so that in the future when you layer on like harder math or newer math that you're not sitting there being like i mean i could answer the question if i could complete the square but i don't know how to do that so now i can't answer the question like i don't want us to be in that situation okay so today we're going to take a look at completing the square uh in three examples all right and then when we come back on monday we're going to do a few more examples and what i really want us to take away from today is the procedure like so how do you do it on monday we're going to talk a little bit about where it comes from and like why we do it this way but for today let's just focus on these are the steps okay so let's start with example number one okay so completing the square Completing the square really means we're trying to make the quadratic look like a perfect square, okay? Meaning we want it to look like like an x plus a number squared. We want it to look like that, x plus a squared, okay? And as we do this, we're gonna wanna make sure that we balance things out. So if we turn it into a perfect square by adding something, then we have to balance that out by subtracting something. And on the flip side, if we make it into a perfect square by subtracting something, we're going to need to add something to keep it balanced, okay? So let's take a look at example number one. We have x squared plus 6x, okay? So x squared plus 6x, that looks like x squared plus 6x plus 9. Why did I choose 9 and not like 10 or 11 or 1 or 5? Why did I choose 9? I chose nine because it's three squared, all right? But why would I choose three squared? Because three plus three gives me six. Okay, so x squared plus six x looks like x squared plus six x plus nine, okay? But what did I add? Like I added this nine. So if I just add the nine, I've changed my whole expression. So in order to keep it balanced, 
to keep it balanced, we're going to write x squared plus 6x plus 9 minus 9. So this plus 9 makes it a perfect square. And this minus 9 balances it out. Okay, so the first 9 makes it the perfect square. The second 9 makes it balanced out. That's why it's a negative instead of like a positive. To finish completing this square, we're going to take x squared plus 6x plus 9 and write it as x plus 3 squared and then minus 9. And again, we have this minus 9 to keep it balanced out. So let's think about the numbers here for a moment. See if we can think about a process, okay? How did we get from six to three? It's actually not B over 2A, but it is part of that. It is part of that, okay? So Thea, the six went into, like if I were to take X plus three squared and foil it out, I would get X squared plus six X plus nine. So because we factored it, the six is no longer visible. Okay. Okay. So here's something for us to kind of write down here, right? We find this A value. I should not choose A. I'm going to choose a different letter. Let's choose K. To find that blue number, we're going to do part of what Richard said. We're going to take the B value and we're going to divide it by 2. So 6 was our B value. And we divided it by 2. 6 divided by 2 gives us 3. Okay. to find the number we highlighted in the yellow. Like some of us might be like, oh yeah, x squared plus 6x looks like x squared plus 6x plus 9. But I'm sure there are some of us out there being like, how does anyone just know that, okay? So if you're one of those folks, the way you find that number in the yellow is you take your half of b, so three in our case, and you square it. Oops half of b and you square it. So b was 6, 6 divided by 2 is 3, and 3 squared is 9. All right, can we try this with something a little bit more complex looking? Maybe. Okay. So let's take a look at example two now. Okay. Uh, so in that case, Richard, we're going to take a look at that in example number three. Okay. So for example number two, all right, 
example number two, what we're going to do is we're going to, we have this in an equation now, and this is more similar to how we're going to see a situation when we need to complete the square, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on just the first two terms, the quadratic term, like the x squared, and the linear term, like the minus 18x. Now, we're also at the same time going to take any other term, mostly the numbers, we're going to move it to the other side. Okay. So my first step here is going to look like x squared minus 18x equals negative 80. Does that first step make sense so far? like logically for this one step. Yeah, okay. So all we've done is just move the number to the other side. And now we're left with x squared minus 18x. And so the question is, what does x squared minus 18x almost look like? or what is the perfect square of that? And so we're gonna do x squared minus 18x. And so 18 or negative 18 is our B value, okay? So negative 18 is our B value. So in order to find the part that we add to it, like our our nine from example one, we have to take half of that. So half of negative 18 is negative nine. And then we have to square it. So negative nine squared is 81. To highlight that in the yellow because that's like our nine from before. And again, this is b over two squared. Now that equals negative 80, but we added something to the left hand side. We added 81 to the left hand side. How do we balance that 81 if we wanted to do something to the right hand side? Okay, if we want to keep it balanced, since there are two sides to the equation, we can go back to that idea of if you do something to one side of the equation, you have to do it to the other side of the equation, okay? So Eric is correct. If we added 81 to the left-hand side, we need to add 81 to the right-hand side to keep it balanced, okay? So the green part is the thing that keeps it balanced. The yellow part is the part that makes it like a perfect square, okay? How are we doing so far? Are we doing okay? All right, so let's clean up what we have and see. So on the left-hand side, I've got x squared minus 18x plus 81. On the right-hand side, I have negative 80 plus 81, or 1, okay? Yeah, Richard, exactly. You could do plus 81 minus 81 on the left-hand side and then add 81 to both sides. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got one last step, which is we want to show that perfect square, that x plus k. We want to show that square. 
So instead of x squared minus 18x plus 81, we're going to write that as x minus 9 squared equals 1. And where did we get the 9 from? 9 is b over 2. All right. Are we ready for example three? This kind of crazy looking one here. All right, so with example number three, okay? I wanted to throw that out there because this is where we're headed. This is the kind of completing the square that's going to be useful for us in this class, in Calc 1, in Calc 2, in Calc 3, okay? So yeah, it might look a little intimidating right now, but I would rather us be intimidated now, figure it out, than get to Calc 2 and be like, what is happening to my life, okay? So here we go. For example three, you might notice a few things. You might notice that there's x squared and x's. You might also notice that there's y squared and y's. And so what we have in these situations is actually two different completing the square problem. Okay, but we're gonna do them at the same time. So we're gonna collect our x terms and we're gonna put them next to each other, okay? And then we're going to collect our y terms and we're going to put those next to each other. And just like we did with example two, I'm going to take the number. So in example two, it was the 80, but in this case, it's the 71 and I'm going to move it to the other side. So this negative 71 moves to the other side. Now this will be the first step that I show in pretty much all the answer keys is to rearrange it so we get something like, here's all my x's together, plus here's all my y's together, equals, let's see, when I add that to the other side, I get a positive 70. And so we can see from here that we've got our y's and our y's, and then we've got our x's and our x's, okay? Now the trick to doing these kinds of questions is really, I think, to stay organized with your work, okay? So let's take a look at just the purple part first. Now, Richard asked a really good question earlier. He said, so this is true only when A equals one. And yes, the process we're doing works when A is one. And so the way that we make that happen is if there's a number in front of the X squared, we have to factor that out, okay? So in this case, we have a 16 in front of the X squared. So I'm gonna take the next step and say 16 times what? will get me back to that purple line above. And so 16 times x squared will give me 16x squared plus hmm, 16 times what gives me 64? 16 times 4x will give me 64. Okay, so I factored out the greatest common factor, uh, the common, uh, numerically, okay? Plus, I'm going to do the same thing with the y's. What number do I factor out this time? Yeah, we factor out the 9. Good. So 9 parentheses y squared minus, let's see, 9 times 2y will give me that, 18. Okay? 
So we've factored out the number for both the X's and the Y's. And now look at what we have. We have A equals one on the inside here. We have A equals one on the inside here, okay? So all we need to do now is in sort of two separate problems, we're going to follow the same process we did for one and two, where we figure out what half of B is and we square it. And then we have to keep both sides of the equation balanced, so the yellow and the green, to keep it balanced, okay? All right, so what's my B value for the X's? Yeah, B is four. So half of four is two. Two squared is four. Okay, let me say that one more time. B is four. So half of B is two. Two squared gives me four or the number that I add to the end. plus nine times. What's the B value for the Y's? Negative two, good, I'm so glad you said negative two. So what's half of negative two? Good, it's negative one, and then negative one squared is plus one. So that's where that plus one comes from. We took the B value, we cut it in half, and we squared it. So we've got this that we added, we've got this that we added. Tell me why this is wrong. because you have to multiply that by what's outside of the parentheses. So four times 16 is what you add to the other side of the equation. Mm -hmm. Very well said. So one of the things we don't wanna forget about is we didn't really add four, we added four 16 times because it, there's a factor of 16 in front. And same thing, we didn't add one to the left-hand side, we actually added nine times one. And so when we add the numbers to the other side, we need to make sure we account for that. So 71 plus 16 times 4 plus 9 times 4. Okay? So we really need to make sure that we include any multiples that we need. Okay. All right, so let's see what we have now. We have 16x squared plus 4x plus 4 plus 9 times y squared minus 2y plus 1 equals and 71 plus 16 times 4 plus 9 times 1 should give us 144. Okay. All right, there are two last things that we need to do, all right? The first thing that we need to do is we need to take these and we wanna write them to show the perfect square, okay? So instead of 16 times x squared plus four x plus four, what should we write? 16 times what? Like what's that perfect square? x plus two squared, good. Because we have x plus half of b is two, and then we square it. Plus nine times y squared minus two y plus one. Well, let's see what perfect square that is. y and then b is negative two, 
and half of negative two is negative one. So that's the perfect square part. We've got one last step, right? So what we want to do is we want to turn the right hand side of the equation into a one. How do we turn that right hand side into a one? Yeah, we could divide both sides by 144. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to divide this by 144. We're going to divide this one by 144. And we're going to divide this one by 144. Divide every single term by 144. And we're going to reduce fraction. The right hand side becomes one. That's good. That was our goal. Okay. Uh, how many times, what does 16 over 144 reduce to? Yeah, one nine, one nine. Richard, you're having a tough day. It's all right, it's all right. It happens to the best of us. Okay, so if 16 over 144 reduces to one nine, then I can rewrite the first fraction as x plus two squared over nine. All right, one nine is the same as divided by nine. Now, if you're like, how did they reduce that fraction so quick? <laughs> you, if you have your calculator, take 144 and divide it by 16. What do you get? If you take 144 divided by 16, you should get 9. All right? And that is what your denominator is going to be. So if we use that idea, what is the denominator of the second fraction? Yeah, 144 divided by 9 gives me 16. Good. Okay. So this whole process right here, so, so long, right? We took this super complicated equation. We had to complete the square not just once but twice in the same problem. We had to make sure we included the multiples of it, so we didn't just want to add four and add one, but we really had to keep a balance by adding 16 times four and nine times one. But what that allowed us to do is get a situation where when we look at the equation in the box, we're gonna know how to graph that. Okay, so the whole purpose of completing the square in this problem is to get an equation in a form that's easy to tell what the graph transformations are. Right? Now, this is a process that I would really, really encourage you to practice. Okay, we're going to see it a lot in today and then on Monday again. Um, explain why we divided it. Okay, so we want a goal we have. So our goal is to um, have the equation equal to one. So we don't want it to equal a random number. We want it to equal one. Uh, we're going to talk about that on the next page. Okay? We're going to talk about that on the next page. Really good questions. All right. So I hope you're not feeling too, too overwhelmed by this process. But like I said, if you learn this process now, it will make your life easier in the future. Okay? All right. So let's take a step back from all of that completing the square. And let's take a look at what equations tell us. Okay? So in this example, we have this equation x plus 3 squared plus y minus 4 squared equals 36. Right. 
Now, when we see something like this, in this particular equation, um, if you have Desmos readily accessible, or you want to just type this into Desmos, let's see what you get, okay? So if you have Desmos, and I'll pull up my Desmos as well, let's graph this and see what we get. <clears throat> So the nice thing about Desmos is you do not have to solve for y in order to graph it. You can put it in however it comes. So x plus 3, close it, square it. Okay, so that's the first part. Plus y minus 4, close it, square it, equals 36. What's the uh for? <laughs> what shape does that give us? A wonder circle. <laughs> yeah, it gives us a circle, right? So here we have this complicated looking equation. And at first you might be like, I don't know, it's like a parabola plus some other things. But what we have here when we have x squared and y squared is we get a circle. Ah, no, we, we don't always need pi in the equation to make it a circle, but pi does end up in a lot of our answers because it's part of the formula. But when we're actually plotting the point, what we have is a center, and then we have, the fancy word for this is a locus, or like a collection of points that are all a certain distance from the center. So before we go back to our graph, where is the center of this circle? See if you can not just like find it, but also, yes, this is why we're going over all those different shapes, uh-huh. But according to the numbers in the equation and from our graph, what is the center of our circle? Whoa, who did that? That was not me. All right, you don't have to speak up. Negative three comma four. Okay, and do we see those numbers, three and four in our equation? We should, okay? So when we look at the equation, we see a positive three and a negative four. But when we switch the signs of those, well, I don't know, like those, horizontal translations we've been talking about where it's like the opposite of what you think. Well, the opposite of positive three is negative three. And the opposite of four, of negative four is positive four. So when we switch the signs of the things inside the squares, we actually get our center point. What's the radius of this particular circle? Radius is six. Where do we see that in our equation? Ah, uh, okay. I don't see a six, but I see a 36. And if we rewrite 36 as six squared, it turns out that number on the other side, that 36, is the radius squared. Okay. So let's go back to our notes. Remember this picture, we're gonna redraw it for ourselves. Okay, so here was our equation, all right? And we've got a general form Okay, so because this is the first time we're seeing this, I want us to write it out as we have, uh oh. Okay, 
So our general form, so when you see an equation that looks like this, parentheses, x minus h squared, plus parentheses, y minus k squared, equals r squared. If it looks like that, then what you have is a circle. Or if you think back to the pictures we were drawing earlier, you have a slice of a cone that is parallel to the base. Now to find our center, we're gonna go ahead and use the H and the K. Okay, so those are gonna tell us the center. In our case, we're gonna have negative three, and a positive four. So maybe make a note to yourself to switch the signs Whoa. from your equation. So this positive three became the negative three and the minus four became the plus four, okay? Those give you the center of your circle. And so let's go ahead and draw that in, negative three, and positive, okay? Now there's a lot of other boxes here which we're gonna use for the ellipse, but when it gets to a circle, if you know it's a circle, you can cross out all this other stuff and just write the radius, okay? Because that's all we need to sketch our circle. And we said from earlier, our radius is not 36, but it's six. So let's write down how we got that. So this r squared is this number. If we want to find the radius, we want to set those equal to each other. Or another way to think about it is you want to take the square root of that number. Okay. Now, I think the easiest way to sort of draw the circle is once you've got your center, you're just going to count out six points in sort of like the north, south, east, west direction. <laughs> So from my center, I'm going to count six units to the right, six units down, one, two, three, four, five, six, six units to the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, and six units up, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Now, when I connect them all, except for the center point, I'll end up with a circle, okay? So when we see a question that uh, is of this form, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared, then that's gonna be a circle, okay? And we can see how easy it was from this form of the equation to graph it. All the numbers in all the places told us exactly what we needed to do, okay? And that, folks, is why we need to know how to complete the square. Because this original um, formula in example three, I don't know from there what the graph is going to look like, but after I complete the square, I can look at all of those numbers in the equation and it will tell me what shape I'm looking at, where the center is, how big it is side to side, how tall it is up and down. It tells us all of that information in that last form. Okay, that's the power of completing the square. So we asked a lot of great questions earlier about why we set it equal to one, how we know what numbers do, and that's what we're gonna do in example number five, okay? So <clears throat> let's take a look at this example for a moment. How is this similar or different to the previous example? Like how is this similar or different from example number four?
Okay, so there's like a numerator, right? So before an example four, it wasn't a fraction. It was just everything was over one. Um, what else is similar or different? The one, okay. So let's go back up for a moment, all right? Humor me for a moment here. And let's write this here. So we had x minus plus three squared plus y minus four squared equals 36, okay? So do you remember in the warm up part, I was like, all right, I want you to divide by 144. And I was like, wow, you want me to divide by 144? What number do you think I want you to divide by now? Yeah, we want to divide by 36, okay? So let's divide by 36. And then we will get x plus 3 squared over 36 plus y minus 4 squared over 36 equals 1. Okay. Now I'm going to write it one more way. I'm going to break it down even more. Now let's take a look at these two equations. The fraction part, now we've made it look like a fraction, okay? But what's different about these two fractions? They are perfect squares, okay? Um, but what's true about these two versus these two. Yeah, in the circle, they're the same number, right? Yeah, and Thea, in this next one, they're different denominators, okay? So when you have the same denominator, okay? Like, let's say we had someone gave you this. They said, oh, x plus three squared over 36, but the denominator for the y is the same thing. A lot of times folks are like, well, I know the denominator is the same, so I'm going to multiply both sides by 36, and then I get the equation we were given, okay? That's why the circle formula tends to be like that because the fraction, the denominators are the same. So they just multiply the whole fraction by that denominator. But here's what these numbers actually tell us. This number right here, uh, the number that's squared, that number tells you how far sideways you go from the center. So we take the center and we go six out in the, uh, to the right and then six out to the left because the six is the number that's squared underneath the x. This number like I'm running out of colors. This number, this six, you see how it's underneath the y? It tells us how far you go up and down from the center. So the number under the x tells you how far you go out side to side. The number under the y tells you how far you go up and down, okay? Now, since I know you guys know x is side to side and y is up and down, it's not that much different to think, okay, the number under x tells me the side to side distance. The number under y tells me 
the y dis distance. Right, so it will be a circle if these numbers are the same, right? Because you go out the same distance in all four directions. But let's see what happens when we have different numbers here. Can someone tell me what they think the center of this circle, uh, of this shape? What is the center of this shape? Okay, good. So we're going to use the same idea where we change the sign. So x is negative 2 or positive 2 and the y is negative 5. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to plot that point right on the grid. So 2, negative 5. Okay. Now, Another way that we could write 4 is 2 squared. And another way we can write 9 is 3 squared. Okay? So let's think about the numbers we saw from the circle. The orange one, or 2 in this case, tells us how far we're going to go side to side from our center. So not the four, but the two. This number tells us how far we go up and down from the center because it's underneath the y. Okay. So we're going to go side to side two and we're going to go up and down three from the center, okay? So let me scroll down to the graph. We drew our center. We're gonna go two to the left, two to the right. And then we're gonna go one, two, three up and one, two, three down. And like we did with the circle, We're going to connect the outside points. Whoa. And we do not have a circle here, but I think we might say we have an oval or an ellipse. Okay. So. Here's the difference, okay, between a circle and an ellipse. A circle is like when we cut straight across and all things are equal from the center. That's why the numbers on the bottom are the same. But if you get to a case where the numbers on the bottom are different, we're going to get an oval or an ellipse, not a circle. All right, so Eric, does that answer your question from earlier about it won't always be a circle? Okay, so here's the general form we're looking for, okay? If we have x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared, if that equals 1, and that's actually part of the definition, it has to equal one in order for us to know that all of these other things are going to be true. Okay, so if you have it equal to a number other than one, you cannot draw the same conclusions about your graph. And that's sort of a back ended way of saying, like, that's why we need to have it equal to one. Okay. All right. So since this is our first time through, let's talk about the general form for um, each of these. So we kind of build in our notes, okay? So when we have the center, that's always gonna be your h comma k. So whatever this number is and this one, we switch the signs and that's gonna give us the center. Now, don't be scared by all this other language, okay? 
Um, let me ask you a question. From our center, did we go out further side to side or up and down? We went further up and down. Okay. So that's actually the definition of our, what we call vertices. Okay. So if you go, um, it's, you use the bigger number in the denominator. Okay. So in this case, the ones that were further away, so this one and this one, those are our vertices, okay? So we need to write their coordinate, all right? Now those red dots, do they have the same X value or the same Y value as the center? They have the same X value. Okay, so when we write our vertices, we're gonna keep the X value the same. And from our center, we added three and we subtracted three. And then we can kind of simplify those. So two comma negative eight and two comma negative two. All right, now let's double check. Two comma negative eight and two comma negative two, are those the coordinates for the red points we had? They should be, right? We counted on the graph, three up and three down. And we did it with numbers. We added three and we subtract three and we got the same answer, okay? So by definition, the vertices are the ones that are further away from the center, okay? The co-vertices are the ones that are closer to the center. That means on our graph, this point and this point are our co-vertices. Fancy word for saying these are the ones that are closer to the center. Okay. Now those orange dots, do they have the same X value or Y value as the center? They have the same y value, exactly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say to the two, I'm gonna add and subtract two. That's the same thing as saying, we're gonna go to the right two and to the left two. And we're gonna keep our y value the same. Okay, so this plus and minus two, that comes from the smaller number in the denominator. And when we simplify these, we'll get zero comma negative five and uh, four comma negative five. And those coordinates should match the orange dots that I have below. All right, so far so good. How are we doing out there? Good, good, okay. All right, so we have one more fancy word that we're gonna apply here, okay? And that is the foci, all right? So if we look at this diagram that I put next to it, so this is like a general case. All right, if you have just like a random ellipse or random oval, then this is sort of how you can graph everything, okay? 
And the only thing that we're missing right now is, are these points right here? And let's, Those points are the foci, okay? Those points are the foci for the ellipse. And so we don't randomly just draw them inside our ellipse somewhere. They actually can be calculated from our equation, okay? So here's the equation on how you calculate it. We're going to take our bigger denominator and we're going to say that equals the smaller denominator plus c squared. Okay. And then c will tell us how to find the foci. So let's use the equation we have. What's the bigger denominator, four or nine? Yeah, nine is the bigger denominator and four is the smaller one. So nine equals four plus C squared. Okay. Now we can solve for C. We're gonna subtract four from both sides. So we get C squared equals five. That means C equals plus or minus the square root of five. I know that's not a nice number, but it didn't mean that you did anything wrong, okay? Now here's where we find the foci. We're gonna take our center and whatever we did for the vertex or the vertices, we're gonna add C to the same thing we did in the vertices. So we added that three to the Y value. So this time we're gonna take our center and we're gonna add and subtract the square root of five. Okay. And if we type that into our calculators, we'll get two comma negative 7.2 and two comma negative 2.7. And we're gonna plot these points on our grid. So two comma negative 2.7 will be about here. And two comma negative 7.2 will be about down there. And so those X's are our foci for our ellipse. All right, let me zoom out for a moment just so you can kind of see the whole question on one page. Um, what kind of questions are coming up for us right now? No questions, too many questions. What's the point of the foci? Great question. So let's address that first thing on um, Monday morning, okay? Thanks for your patience. What's C again? C is the distance from the center to the foci. Okay, so if we zoom in on the picture, uh, the distance from the vertex to the center is A, but the distance from the foci to the center is C. Okay, 
And then the distance from the center to the co-vertex is B. Okay. So let's take a look at this question, right? We were able to do so much from this question. Question two or question five, because we had it in the right form. But when we look at example number six, that's like a really terrifying form because we can't pull any of the numbers from the same place. So what we need to do is, this problem should look super familiar because this is example number three from earlier when we were completing the square, right? So when we get questions that look like this form, the first thing we need to do is we need to complete that square, okay? Um, Richard, so if the vertices were on the x-axis, it'd be h plus or minus c, a, a not c, but yes. For the sake of time, I'm going to copy our completing the square from earlier, okay? So we're gonna take all this work we did earlier and we're going to duplicate it and then we're gonna bring it down. Shrink it a little bit so it all fits. Okay. So we did all this work earlier because what it got us is a form of the equation from which we can interpret the graph. Okay. So we can take a look at this and say those denominators, one is nine, one is 16. So I know it's not a circle, but for the shape, we can say it's an ellipse. So given this equation, let's pull the important information from here now. What do we have as the coordinate of the center? Yeah, Richard, that's fine. If you say that it's the foci, then yes, x plus or minus c. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, our center here is going to be negative 2 comma 1 because we just take our k value and our h and k values and we switch the signs and we get two com negative 2 comma 1. Now, if you're a visual person, I would 100% start plotting as you go, okay? So I have my center here. Now, from our center, which, how many units do I, uh, oh, okay, sorry. Um, which direction do I count out more spaces, in the y direction or the x direction? The y direction, okay, so how many, units do we count up and down in the y direction from the center? Okay. So sometimes, okay, from my equation, I actually take a step to write it like this. Instead of nine, I might write three squared. And instead of 16, I might write four squared. And the reason why I might do that is because the three and the four, those help me with the graphing. The nine and the 16 don't really help me with the graphing, okay? 
So it's like a reminder to myself that I have to take the square root of that number to tell how far I count in which direction, okay? So if we take our side to side direction here, we're gonna count three out in both directions and in the up and down direction, we'll count out four. So let's see, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so we have our vertices because they are a greater distance from the center. We have our covertices because they are closer to the center. And if we want to think about what's changing for the vertices, we're going to keep the x, but we're going to change the y by going up and down four. And then for the co-vertices, we add or subtract to the x, and we keep the y value of that the same, okay? All right, how do we find the foci? Okay. How do we set up our equation so we can find the C value? The larger and the smaller denominator, good. So our larger denominator was 16. So I'm gonna put that on one side by itself. The smaller number denominator was nine, good. And then nine plus C squared, okay? Now, if we move some things around, we'll get C squared equals seven. So C equals plus or minus square root of seven. And we should expect that the foci are not always gonna be nice numbers and that's okay, all right? But are we going to add this C value to the X value or to the Y value? We're gonna add it to the Y value. Now here's the deal. The foci are in the same direction. As the vertices. So if you add it up and down for the vertices, you're gonna add up and down for the foci. So negative two comma one plus or minus root seven. And let's see what that gives us. One plus root seven is about 3.6. So that's one foci. And then one minus root seven is negative 1.6. So here is the other. Both okay. So this idea of using, sorry, this idea of using completing the square gets this messy looking equation into a form that is easy to pick the parts out so that you can graph the shape. Okay. Now I know we're running a little short on time but I did want to show us a couple of things. So first of all, our good friends, Ernie and Bert. I don't know if you ever watched Sesame Street, but I think it's a pretty bomb show. Um, but what I like about Ernie and Bert too is that there's really sort of like two types of ellipses, all right? So sometimes you have an ellipse that looks more like this one, right? That's the one we've seen so far. Um, and I tend to call this one, like, I'll refer to it as a Bert ellipse, because Bert has, like, the longer head, right? And then the other one I usually call the Ernie ellipse, because Ernie has, like, a wider head, okay? But when we are looking at both of them, the determining factor is um, the vertices are always the ones that are further away from the center. Okay, so in this case, the Bert ellipse, this and this 
those are the vertices, okay? So it's sort of like where his hair is and where his chin is, okay? But in the Ernie ellipse, the vertices are like where his ears are because those are the ones that are further away from the center, okay? I suppose you could say the nose is the center for both of them. It looks pretty much where it is, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the ducks are cute. If you haven't watched the Ernie video of his like rubber ducky song, that's a pretty cute one. I maybe, as I was looking for like the best Ernie and Bert picture, I maybe fell down a rabbit hole of like watching Ernie and Bert videos. My roommate was like, what are you doing? I was like, prepping for my lesson. Yeah, we could have a parabola in there for their mouth, okay? Um, but one of the things I really want us to kind of take away from today is the vertices are all about perspective. The vertices are not always top bottom. They're not always side side. It's which one is further away. Okay, so it could be an Ernie situation that it's the ears or the Bert is like the hair and the chin. Okay. Um, for those of you who were like, the way we talked about finding all the points made sense to you because we tied it into the picture. That's awesome. Okay. But if you were like, I really wish you would just give us some equations here, are some equations so that you can kind of think about like where all the different things come from, okay? One word of caution here though. This particular textbook, and the problem with this is every textbook does it differently. This textbook changes the A, like they keep the A underneath the X here, but then all of a sudden the A is underneath the Y here. It doesn't actually matter which one you call A and which one you call B, but in this equation, okay, A squared is bigger than B squared. Okay, so just keep that in mind. The A squared is the bigger number, all right? But if the letters confuse you, just think about which number on the bottom is bigger, and that should help take care of that, okay? All right, um, so let's do this. Let's go ahead and stop here for today. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. All right, so we're gonna stop here for today, okay? Um, I am totally happy with how this morning went. I feel like we definitely cleared up some understanding for 3.7, which for me was probably the most important part, okay? Um, we also got started on conic sections, which is important that we get started today. Um, let's do this. Let's um, bump quiz 10 to next week. So quiz 10 will be due with quiz 11 next week, okay? So no quiz 10 due this Friday, okay? If you want to do it, get it out of the way, I think you'll be able to do most of the problems, all right? But if you're like, mm, I'd really rather just spend today focusing on studying for the exam tomorrow, you'll have the space to do that as well, okay? All right, well, if there are no other questions, then I will let you folks go for today. Um, there are, there's tutoring session this afternoon if you wanna get some last minute help on um, studying for the test. And uh, I'm sure Val would be happy to help you out with quiz 10 if you wanted to get ahead on that too. But otherwise, you got nothing else to do. Um, don't forget to turn in your classwork 10 though if you didn't do that already, okay? All right, bye folks, have a good day.